throughout the month of November, our attention is being drawn to paying attention. So often we move through our lives in a state of autopilot, failing to notice the tiny affirmations, as Mary Oliver states, of our place in the family of things. Our opening words this morning come from the poet David White, and they encourage us to notice, to pay attention. Everything is waiting for you. Your great mistake is to act the drama as if you were alone, as if life were a progressive and cunning crime with no witness to the tiny hidden transgressions. To feel abandoned is to de deny the intimacy of your surroundings. Surely, even you at times have felt the grand array, the swelling presence and the chorus crowding out your solo voice. You must note the way the soap dish enables you, or the window latch grants you freedom, courage. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. The stairs are your mentor of things to come. The doors have always been there to frighten you and invite you. And the tiny speaker in the phone is your dream ladder to divinity. Put down the weight of your aloneness and ease into the conversation. The kettle is singing even as it pours you a drink. The cooking pots have left their arrogant aloofness and seen the good in you at last. All the birds and creatures of the world are unutterably themselves. Everything is waiting for you. So for our time for all ages, I'm going to need a volunteer that is somewhere between the ages of three and 20. <laughs> all right, Griffin, come on up. Yay. All right, so I'm going to have you, I'm going to have you sit right here, okay? This is not like time out. You're not in trouble. <laughs> but there's going to be something really interesting about to happen, and you're going to be in the front row seat, okay? It's really great. It always is really great, I know. Okay. <laughs> You shouldn't laugh like that. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about, do you, does anyone know what this image is depicting? Uh, Grayson. It is, it's, it's a reflection or a projection actually. So this comes from an allegory or parable known as Plato's cave. So make sort of the, oh, noise if you've ever heard of Plato's cave. OK, good. Some of you are just pretending because you, you, the person next to you was making noise. So the allegory of Plato's cave, the character, one of the main characters is Socrates. OK? That's also a name that you probably know. Make the sound. Oh, very good. I knew it was a learned group. So there is this story of a group of people who, for whatever reason, have been basically imprisoned in a cave. And, and they're facing into the cave with their backs to the mouth of the cave. And so they can't see out at all. And it's actually kind of a twisty cave, and so even if they turned their heads, they still couldn't see out. They're deep enough in the cave, in the dark, and they're, they're seated in chairs, just like Griffin is, only they are tied to the chairs. I will not tie you to the chair because we're friends. Also, even if we weren't friends, I wouldn't tie you to the chair, just to be clear. So in this story, these people, all they can see is a wall of the cave. 
and behind them there's a fire and people behind them are are making sort of like shadow puppets and the folks sitting there who have always sat staring at this cave wall that is their whole reality they don't know anything so when in this picture they see this giant bird they don't know that it's a guy behind them holding up a little bird puppet okay so for them maybe that's the bird god and he's angry you know they tell themselves stories of these projections that they see okay so you keep looking that way griffin because i don't want to spoil the surprise so imagine if you will that everything that you see in this projection goes from being sort of wonderful to sort of where to go scary ah. bah. Bah. was that really scary say yes i know you i know it wasn't exactly but say yes it was really scary <laughs> so but this is what it was it was my alpaca puppet but when i shine it here and go there is some big monster behind you and it's coming up and that would be really scary and if that's all you knew if you didn't know that i had the adorable puppet but all you saw was this beast come on. well it doesn't look very impressive there does it <laughs> note to self be closer to the source of light <laughs> there much scarier there's like 14 sermons wrapped up in this i just <laughs> there's so much we could do with this Thank you, Griffin, for being my person staring at the cave wall. You can go back and sit. So why am I telling you, will you do that? Thank you, Emma. The story of Plato's cave. You don't have to guess, I'll tell you. <laughs> because sometimes we have a limited amount of information and we base a whole big story, sometimes the whole big story of our lives, on this limited piece of information. And we don't even know that we are staring at a wall. So in the story of Plato's cave, one person from that imprisoned group is set free. And they're taken outside. Well, you can imagine if the only light they've ever seen is the reflection of a fire behind them and they get outside and the sun oh my goodness they don't have any context for understanding what that big ball of light is well, that person would need to be really nurtured along and exp uh, be explained to that everything that was real to them was based in a falsehood it was not based in a reality. You can imagine that if the person survived that, because that's shattering to have someone say everything you thought you knew was based on a trick that someone played on you. And I'm super sorry, but there you go. If they survived that psychological break, then they would probably want to go in and tell their friends, the people in the chairs staring at the wall, there's something wonderful outside. No, oh, oh, there are monsters. We've seen them. They come up and ah. Okay? So it, it's partly to do with perspective. It's partly to do with opening ourselves to the thought that we might not have the full picture all the time. And that is giddy and freeing and terrifying all at once. What a great adventure. I'm going to turn things over right now to Eugene Abrahamson, who is here to share with us a bit about hearts and hands. So Eugene. Mm -hmm. Good morning. 
Uh, I've been here before, and uh, some of you look familiar, and some of you I haven't seen in over a year. But anyway, Hearts and Hands, as it was stated earlier, is a neighbor helping neighbor volunteer organization. And if it wasn't for our volunteers, the organization really wouldn't exist. And so you have to imagine that as a volunteer, that you get to share your time and talents with an individual um, over the age of 60. And um, there's probably a few people in the room over the age of 60. <clears throat> Some people stop driving, and it's not because they want to stop driving, it's just that they have to. It could be that they weren't the main driver in the house, and that driver has passed on, and now they have to drive again, or they never drove to begin with. Uh, they could have an eye uh, surgery that happened, and that continues, and they can't see, or they can't see at night. And so they need someone to drive them places. And just because you don't drive doesn't mean you can't go anywhere. It just means temporarily you may not be able to go anywhere. And so if you stayed home for a month or two yourself, you would see what that was like. And maybe you would feel isolated or disconnected to people. And if that went on for a really long time, you might be disconnected from the world. And maybe you have TV and you can watch TV, uh, but that, you know, doesn't last very long in some making you connected to the rest of the world. As a volunteer, you get to select the assignments that work for you. We don't ask you to do anything that you can't do and that doesn't fit your schedule. Um, driving is our number one request, but people have other requests like light housekeeping, um, helping p fix things around the house, uh, doing yard work, friendly visits, or caregiver respite. Um, and a lot of that you don't know that's going on, that somebody's caregiving for somebody, and that they need to leave that space and do something, maybe go grocery shopping or take a nap, because caregiving can be a 24-hour job. Um, you can volunteer as often as you wish. You can do it weekly, you can do it monthly, you can do it seasonally. Um, and we give you mileage uh, reimbursement and we also cover you in excess automobile and liability insurance so you're covered. And we're lucky because, you know, we do about 200 rides a week. You would think out of 200 people you'd have at least one accident. We're very fortunate because I think volunteers, as we age, we become better drivers. Maybe we get better at that. And we don't really have any accidents that I could tell you about, because uh, I would certainly love, certainly love to do that. Um, you can sign up today, and I'll be out at the coffee and conversation piece afterwards. Uh, you could buy a cookbook, many of our Volunteers and care receivers put together a cookbook. Um, we're doing a volunteer training here next week on Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning to make it convenient for you. I could twist your arm a little bit if that would help. Um, and then I, one of our volunteers who I have known since I've worked at Hearts and Hands, her name is Carol, and she was a volunteer who joined in the very beginning when Hearts and Hands was born in 2003. And Carol still volunteers. And so she was an Akron person and she lost her husband and she was home alone. And her children were all adults and living on their own. And Marianne Pula, who was the minister who started Hearts and Hands, twisted her arm a lot and got her to volunteer. And so she still volunteers, not as much as she used to. But I asked her what that, why she bothered to do that for so long, because that's a long period of time. And she said, you know, it's a reason to get up every day and to see somebody different and not people who are in your general circle. And a lot of times those people have moved away and or don't live with you anymore. And so she still does that every so often. And she um, 
is probably our longest volunteer who's volunteered for us. And so when I am around someone like that, and I see people like you, I think you have to get in the driver's seat and come and join us. It's a fun experience. You meet people that you would never have met before. There might be people from your church who are receiving rides or other services from our volunteers. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, it's simple, it's not a heavy lift for you, and uh, I hope it would be fun and uh, it would bring some joy to your heart. So thank you again, and Ron's gonna talk to you a little bit about what he does uh, for Hearts and Hands. Ron Palmieri, and I'm the official liaison <clears throat> between our church and Hearts and Hands. Uh, a few years ago when I was still working, I was working with a fella, a little older than I, and he was doing some running and I was doing some running at the time. And I said to him one day, I says, you know, I'm hoping that this running will maybe add some years to my life. He said, no, no. He said, you do it to feel good today. You do it to feel good today. Why do I mention this? Well, recent studies have indicated that volunteering can help alleviate loneliness, and like exercise, it can help maintain or improve mental health, your mental health, to feel good today. I've been a volunteer with Hearts and Hands for more than four years, and I remain totally convinced of the goal that was mentioned earlier to help older individuals to remain as independent as possible. And each year when we have this plate sharing service, I mention the motto of Hearts and Hands that first got my attention. And I would like to read it to you again. It says, we do volunteering differently. Set your own schedule, accept only the assignments which fit your schedule and interests. We handle all the arrangements. Whether you have an hour a day, an hour a month, even if you're only available part of the year, you can help. As Eugene mentioned, um, this Saturday in the Channing Chapel at 10 o'clock, we're gonna have uh, training to become a volunteer. It takes about an hour and a half uh, to complete the training and after you complete the training you volunteer only if and when you want to do so. And also like Eugene mentioned we'll be available in the Emerson Room after to answer any questions if you want to sign up for volunteering. Um, for the plate donation today I ask you to be generous for this most worthwhile program and to remember volunteering with Hearts and Hands and your donation this morning will help you feel good today. It's November and we are paying attention. We are paying attention to all that clamors for our immediate response and we are paying attention to the quiet moments between those moments of activity. We are paying attention to what is going on outside of us and inside of us, the depths of us. Paying attention means slowing down, not moving so fast that we lose sight of what is important, being mindful not to sacrifice that which endures on the altar of the fleeting and temporary. Today we're going to turn our focus inward, seeking greater understanding for what makes us and others tick. To help us look inward and ultimately outward, we will be turning to the wisdom of James Fowler, a seminal figure in the field of developmental psychology, particularly around ethics, faith, and moral development. 
No, this will not be a college lecture on psychology. Hopefully it won't be a lecture on anything, but it will be a reflection on the human condition and finding tools to help us understand ourselves and others better. When we have greater understanding, we can exhibit greater compassion as we seek common ground with those who may seem very different from us, some of whom may be sitting in close proximity to you right now. Fowler developed a way to organize and understand human faith development that corresponds to human physical, mental, and emotional development. Faith development is not so different as we may sometimes think. Since I'm going to be using the term faith, we need to develop a common understanding of the word. So let's look at Fowler's definition. He writes, faith as imagination grasps the ultimate conditions of our existence, unifying them into a comprehensive image in light of which we shape our responses and initiatives our actions. Faith, then, is an active mode of knowing, of composing a felt sense or image of the condition of our lives taken as a whole. Uh, I promised that this was not going to be a college lecture, and here I am with a mighty mouthful of words to define a tiny little five-letter word that comes loaded with all kinds of expectations and assumptions. So let's distill all of Fowler's wordy wisdom into one simple sentence. Faith is the container to sort and make meaning of our experiences. That will be our working definition of faith for today. I know that some of us struggle with language of reverence. Many of us are refugees from other traditions. And so I hope you will take on this definition, faith as a container, where we can sort out and make meaning of our experiences and thus our life. Fowler differentiates faith from belief. Our beliefs might make up the content of our faith, they might be in that container, but they are not synonymous with it. Faith is a way of shaping our reality, an orientation in the world, while beliefs are subject to change. Fowler asserts that asking about and responding to questions of belief can be really shallow and easily dismissed. That faith is deeper and requires different questions. Rather than asking, what do you believe? Fowler suggests, on what or whom do you set your heart? Faith, unlike belief, is a universal feature of human living, recognizably, recognizably similar everywhere, despite the remarkable variety of forms and contents of religious practice and belief. So when we talk about faith development, we're not talking about instilling beliefs. We are creating the container to sort and make meaning of our experiences, which may result in a set of values or beliefs. Fowler identifies six stages to human faith development. And I know these are fuzzy, but I'll be talking about them individually, so that will help. Because faith development can be tied to human psychological development, although the two do not necessarily move at the same pace, there will be some age ranges associated with these stages of faith. Please note that there are people who remain at a faith stage for their whole lives while they continue to develop and age in other ways. Although I will share with you Fowler's associated age ranges, I don't find them particularly helpful in the study of faith development unless we look at the typical behaviors associated with those ages. And then they can really be spot on. The first stage is actually stage zero. 
the primal or undifferentiated faith. <clears throat> this corresponds psychologically with birth to about two years old. This stage is characterized by an early learning of the safety of the environment. For example, warm, safe, and secure, as opposed to hurt, neglect, and abuse. If we experience our world as trustworthy and safe, then we experience the universe or the divine in that same way. If we have negative experiences of neglect and harm, we interpret the universe as being an unsafe and potentially malicious place. Stage one is intuitive, projective faith, and it corresponds with the psychological development of ages three to seven. Religion is learned mainly through experiences, through stories and images, and the people that we come into contact with. It's because of this correspondence between psychological development and faith development, both communicated through and influenced by stories that so many faith traditions concentrate on stories and building familiarity with the characters in those stories as we teach our children in that age range, three to seven. I also find that when I'm sharing a story with you up here, everybody's listening, everybody's getting something, so that stories are not limited to children between the ages of three and seven, in case you were feeling a little panicky there. It's okay to like stories. They touch us in a way that logic simply can't. So now we arrive at tricky stage two, mythic literal faith. Developmentally, this is associated with school-age children. But again, it is possible to remain at this faith stage throughout adulthood. This stage is characterized by a strong belief in justice and reciprocity in the universe. Deities are almost always strongly anthropomorphic, having human qualities. Metaphors and symbolic language are often misunderstood and taken literally. I call stage two tricky because it is so easy to recognize it in others and so difficult to recognize it in ourselves. We might recognize a stage two faith development, say, in a person who believes in a literal hell or in a world, an earth that is 6,000 years old. We might go, Psh, yep, you're stage two. You're so stage two. And we'd feel pretty good about that. But do we recognize that kind of literalism in ourselves when we reject God based on the same literal interpretations of the Bible. Well, that's different. <laughs> Both are fundamentalist positions. It is just easier for us to acknowledge them in someone other than ourselves. So in our Time for All Ages today, we talked a little bit about the parable of Plato's cave. You remember in the parable, the people are confined in such a way that they can't see what's behind them. All they can see are shadows and projections. They have no frame of reference beyond what they could see and directly experience. And so for them in the parable, the world was full of scary things, full of monsters. And although they had an experience that was completely real, that was real fear. It was completely false. What they experienced through their senses had no basis in reality. There were no monsters, <laughs> except maybe the people who were playing this trick on them. The content of their faith was built on illusion. In this parable, Socrates, who plays the role of the teacher, a fitting role, supposes what would happen if one of those imprisoned was set free, shown the truth, and what a shock that would be to their system, and how much patience it would take to bring that person into accepting a different kind of reality than what they had experienced. That anger and fear that could be part of that process is something that we see in fundamentalism. No matter what the content may be, the content can be sacred or secular. 
fundamentalist believer, fundamentalist non-believer. It's both, they're both fundamentalist ways of thinking. And the experience of being shaken away from that certainty of belief is the same, no matter what the content of those beliefs may be. And that experience is not just difficult, it is shattering. So, the third stage. The third stage of faith development is known as synthetic conventional faith. Isn't it nice that these are such memorable titles? What does this even mean? This is associated with adolescence, roughly age 12 to young adulthood. This stage is characterized by conformity to religious or non-religious authority and the development of a personal identity. Any conflicts with one's beliefs are ignored at this stage due to the fear of threat from inconsistencies. So let me give you an example. We're in stage three. Uh, the truth is the truth. If you've ever seen the bumper sticker, um, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, that's stage three, just to help you have a sense for that. I was a solid stage three when I entered young adulthood. As many of you know, I went to Bob Jones University for the first semester of my freshman year of college. At 17, I was what you might call a Sunday school scholar well-schooled in both Hebrew and Christian scriptures, had lots of stuff memorized, and very comfortable in my faith as a beloved child of God. All of my experience, all of my personhood was wrapped up in who I was as a person of faith. And so I went to Bob Jones expecting a confirmation of that identity of a beloved child of God. But you see, I was a stage three person, and I went to a stage two institution. The God I encountered at Bob Jones was not the loving God of my upbringing. And my identity as a cherished and beloved child was quickly beaten down. I was not a cherished child of God. I was a reprobate. I had questions. I had opinions. And when I could not reconcile those roles or those understandings, I knew that I had to leave or lose myself. What I did not expect was that in the process of leaving, with all of the questions and the ponderings and the uncertainty, that I was leaving not only a stage two institution, but also my stage three way of being in the world. I could no longer conform to religious authority. Probably, if I were to take a poll, which I won't, but you can internally raise your hand, you might be in this place because you have a problem with religious authority. Internally raise your hand. Don't really do it. OK, I can see all those hands. I knew I was in good company. So rather than ignoring those inconsistencies or trying to squish them back into the box that it was so comfortable, I obsessed over those inconsistencies. And I was thrust into Fowler's stage four of faith development without even knowing what was happening. Suddenly, I was doing weird stuff. I was taking responsibility for my beliefs. I was engaging in the struggle. I wasn't satisfied with answers anymore was much more interested in questions. Internally raise your hands, leave them down. Fowler labels the fourth stage as individuative reflective. At least this one makes sense to me. I understand these words. And it's often associated with young adulthood. You know, that time from mid-20s to late 30s when you're really sorting out your life, that's what this level of faith development is also about. Just a reminder that just because these stages of faith development are associated with age ranges, you do not automatically graduate to the stage as you move into that age range. I know plenty of stage two literalists, biblical and atheist. We're well into middle age and beyond. When we say no to an experience or a new way of being in the world, we say no to moving on to the next developmental stage.
that's not meant to sound like I'm wagging my finger at you. It's an invitation to say yes. Stage five. Fowler names this conjunctive faith, and it's associated with the transitions of midlife. This stage acknowledges paradox and transcendence. It relates reality behind the symbols of an inherited system. We are able to resolve the conflicts from the previous stages by a complex understanding of multi-dimensional and interdependent truth that can't be explained in any particular statement. I think conjunctive faith is what Unitarian Universalism strives to be. It's what I aspire to in my own faith development and in my development as a human being. Our principles allude to this multidimensional faith as we affirm acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth, as well as a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. So that's the first five stages of faith development according to Fowler. But there's a sixth. Fowler calls this universalizing faith. We might refer to it as enlightenment. In this stage, the individual treats all persons with compassion as they view all people as from a universal community. It's possible to reach this level of enlightenment, but it is notable that we can name a very few that seem to have reached this sixth stage. The Buddha, Jesus, maybe Mother Teresa, there are others, depending on your cultural paradigm and faith tradition, but the point is that there are not very many of these notable individuals. This level of attainment involves a level of compassion and justice making that most of us simply won't achieve in our lifetimes. What is most important is that we continue to evaluate the content of our faith, what's inside our container the beliefs or the disbeliefs that we subscribe to, and that we recognize where we are in our personal development. We gather in community to challenge and support one another in the goal of faith development. As Fowler writes, I believe that when a community expects and provides models for significant continuing faith development in adulthood, its pattern of nurturing the faith of children and youth will change and become more open-ended. Communities that call persons to ongoing adult development and faith will not fear the intimacy of conflict, nor the inevitable presence in growing faith of doubt and struggle. A faith community that provides for the nurture of ongoing adult development and faith will create a climate of developmental expectation. It will provide help for people in naming and clarifying the shape of their callings and challenges in the community and the wider world at each stage of their faith growth. As the self-appointed translator of Fowler's love for words, I will translate this to, we love you as you are, and we will love you into becoming the more you can be. Today, we are paying attention to our own faith development, to the container where we sort and make meaning of our experiences. And if you were paying attention to Fowler's words a moment ago, you heard that the quality of faith formation that we do with our children is directly related to the expectation that adults engage in their own growth and that the church provides those opportunities. I wonder. Do we have an expectation for that kind of faith development? It is one of the goals of my ministry with you that we become that kind of community. A community that engages in opening to the ideals of Unitarian Universalism as a stage five faith, with the recognition that we are part of an interdependent web. A community that affirms and promotes each person's free and responsible search for truth and meaning, no matter what age or stage of development. If we do that, if we lift up the expectation that everyone is on a journey of faith development, and that as a community we will lovingly create opportunities to grow our souls, 
I believe we can begin to build the bridges that can be inclusive and expansive and provide us the courage to live into our greatest potential. And as always, when I say something that is that profound, we should sing about it. <laughs>